Hello. And welcome to this service of worship from the Buckingham, Bicester and Brackley Methodist Circuit. My name is Steve Mann. I'm Superintendent Minister of the Circuit and whoever you are and wherever you may be watching this from, you're very, very welcome. The service that we're going to share in today has been recorded in our Bicester Church and our hope and prayer is that through it you may be enabled to worship God and God may be enabled to speak to your heart and change your life. My Saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shone that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? Welcome to worship here this morning. Some words from Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there's no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. And so we come to worship God in the words of the hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to thee.
down. And let's come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, help us to thirst for you first and foremost in our lives and recognise that your loving kindness is better than life itself. Bearing this amazing love in mind, we raise our hearts and voices to proclaim and sing your praise. Open our eyes, ever-present God, to see you here and now, in this place and in one another. Open our ears, word of life, to hear you speaking in the words we hear and say and sing, and in the silence. Open our hearts, transforming spirit, to change and renew each one of us in our lives together and in our witness to the world. Open our minds to your greatness and our lives to your service. Lord our God, nothing is hidden from your eyes. Your light shines into the darkness of this world and into the shadows of our hearts. You see our thoughts, our motives, words and actions, and we confess that we must cause you sadness in our response to all that you have given us. Forgive us, we pray, and by your grace and mercy, bring us to that place where your light might shine from us and reveal nothing but your eternal love. Lord, as we turn to you, we know that you freely forgive us because of Jesus, and we give you thanks. Amen and we join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. King of kings, majesty, God of heaven, living in me, gentle saviour, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at your throne.
Do sit down, and now we're going to hear our first reading from Isaiah. The reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 to 9. Invitation to the thirsty. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Thanks be to God. Our next song mirrors that reading. It's from a psalm. Um, As the deer pants for the water, and you can hear the the reading we had there, come you who are thirsty, come to the waters. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you.
sit down? Can we have our second reading now from Luke's Gospel, please? The New Testament reading is taken from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 9. Repent or perish. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tar in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. It was a horrible thing to happen, wasn't it? The latest news story at the time, and people had come to ask Jesus what he thought about it. What about those people that the tower that had got mixed up with the revolution? We don't know much about what had happened at the time of um, these sacrifices in the temple. The implication is that some people from Galilee had come to offer sacrifices at the temple. And for whatever reason, they were regarded as terrorists by the Roman authorities. That was the Roman authorities in the person of Pontius Pilate. And we know about him because that's the same Pontius Pilate who signed, who, pres- who presided at the trial of Jesus, who in effect signed his death warrant. And so those people being killed at the time they were supposed to be offering sacrifices, they were Galileans. And that Jesus' disciples said to him, well, what about them? What have they done that was wrong? And, you know, we ask those sorts of questions ourselves, don't we? When something goes wrong in our lives or in someone close, the lives of someone close to us, we say, what have I done to deserve this? What did they do to deserve that? And that's what they're saying to Jesus. It was the news of the day. People were appalled by it. And they were saying, what did they do to deserve that? They were just offering their sacrifices. Now, the Jewish people at that time really believed that any suffering was the result of sin. And so they were saying to themselves, those people who suffered in that way must have been exceptionally sinful. And it's that belief that Jesus refutes here. He said that those Galileans who were killed were no better and no worse than anyone else. And then he goes on and he says, everyone needs to repent. He's saying everyone needs to come to God. Everyone needs to turn to God. And not any one of us, he says, is good enough for God. All of us need that. That's what God wants. And then Jesus went on and reminded them of another news story. A story they just heard about 18 people who had died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. 
And so he's saying, first of all, it isn't just the Galileans who are victims of a disaster. You, you know how they felt about Galileans. Um, the people of Jerusalem looked at Galilee, and it's way up there in the north. It was a place where they talked with funny accents, where it was difficult to understand their dialect sometimes. Whereas in Jerusalem, of course, they were proper Jews, weren't they? And you know, they were all right. But Jesus says, no, it's not just the Galileans. Didn't you hear about those people on whom the Tower of Siloam felt, fell? And the Tower of Siloam was in Jerusalem. We've heard of the Pool of Siloam. The Tower of Siloam was somewhere near there. Everyone knew about the event. It had been top news. And the Jewish people, residents of Jerusalem, on whom that tower had fell, again, Jesus says, they're no better or no worse than anyone else. But everyone, he says, needs to come to to God. Everyone needs to to return to God. Everyone needs to repent. It's one of those questions we ask, don't we? Why does it happen? You might remember, those of you who are old enough, a, a guy called David Watson, who was a prominent minister based in York. And he spoke at huge conferences. He led many successful missions. But as a relatively young man, he got cancer. And it was terminal. And he agonized about it. You can still read his books today explaining about what happened to him. But he said that he didn't believe that God was sitting up in heaven looking down and saying, there's David Watson down there and he's done a few bad things recently, so I'll inflict cancer on him. He said, that's not what God is like. So what is God like? We're told in the Bible what God is like. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. And yet we have to balance that love with those things that happen in our world. John Polkinghorne you might have heard of, maybe. He was a professor of mathematical physics in Cambridge, I guess long retired now. And he wrote this. You can tell he's a, a professor from the way he writes. He says this, God does not bring about everything that happens in the world. Because God is a God of love, he allows creatures to be themselves and to make themselves. That sort of valuable, worthwhile, independent creation has a cost. We see that in the terrible cruel, we see that in the terrible cruel choices of humankind. We also see it in the physical history of the world. Exactly the same biochemical processes that enable some cells to mutate and produce new forms of life, the very engine that's driven the amazingly fruitful history of life on Earth, will allow other cells to mutate and to become malignant. You can't have the one without the other. The tragic fact is that there is cancer in the world and it's not because God didn't bother, it's a necessity in a world allowed to make itself. I've just been reading through the the book of Job and the book of Job is the story of a man who loses everything. He loses his wife and his children and his business and his wealth and his health. All the way through, his so-called friends try to tell him that he must have done something terribly wrong for God to treat him in that way. But right near the beginning of the book, Job has admitted to God that he's a sinner and asks for forgiveness and pardon. He tells God he's unworthy. And throughout the story, Job remains entirely faithful to God, come what may. And at the end of it all, Job receives far more than he'd lost in the first place from the hand of God. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. That's what the Bible says. You all heard of Einstein. Einstein was actually a Jewish refugee um, who came to Britain um, and became very, very well known, as you know. He said, God is mysterious, but not malicious. So Jesus drew attention here to some horrible events that, that had happened, but he didn't apportion blame. 
What he did say is that all of us need to repent. All of us need to turn to God. And he says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. The opportunity to repent, to turn to God, is offered to us because God loves us. In John's Gospel, Jesus put it like this, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we're offered the opportunity to come to God, to repent and to receive eternal life. Well, what about that fig tree? Fig trees were iconic in Israel. You know, everyone had a fig tree. They do pretty well in this country as well. We have one in our garden. Um, I'm sure you will know people who have them around. Um, during um, Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, from north to south, lived in safety, every one under their own vine and under their own fig tree. So in the Bible, this was how, to, how you knew you had a good life. You had a vine and a fig tree in your garden. And when the prophets in the Old Testament berated people for their way of life, they said that the vines and fig trees would be dug up and destroyed. The fig tree itself represented Israel in many ways. And it was usual for someone who had a vineyard with lots of vines, not just a garden, to plant a fig tree in it. And in that climate, the fruits would re um, appear reliably year after year after year after year. And even a very young tree would have some fruit. And a fig tree does something very strange with its fruits. Um, it creates little tiny fruits that stay on the, st on the stems of the tree all through the winter. However cold it is, even when it's frosty in this country, you can still see the fruits are there. So if you come across a fig tree that has no fruit on it at any time of year, then there is something seriously wrong. And so this guy had a fig tree in his vineyard. They usually grow really well. They have enormous roots and they spread. But this guy came along to look at his fig tree and said, well, it's not doing anything. Three years running I've come along. There's no fruit, no sign of fruit. There's something wrong. I'm going to have it out. We have a tree like this in our garden. We call it the Japanese tree. I don't know what species it is at all, but it looks sort of Japanese. Last year, its leaves began to go brown and crispy, way before the autumn. And John said, I'm going to have it out. Well, I said, well, wait to see whether it recovers or not next spring. So far, it's still brown and crispy. And there don't seem to be any signs of green shoots. So I think its days may be numbered. The vineyard gardener didn't want to give up on his fig tree. He wanted to give it every opportunity to bear fruit. And so he did everything possible. He'd dig around it. He'd ease the soil compaction. He'd apply fertilizer. And if after another year of tender loving care, the tree still failed to produce anything, then it would be time to cut it down. When Jesus was telling this story, he was well into the three years of his ministry. Would three years be enough time for the people he'd talked to, the people who'd heard his message, to turn to God? And what about that bit that Isaiah wrote? That part of Isaiah is written against a background of exile and return. The Hebrew people had been taken into exile in Babylon when their country was invaded and taken over by the Babylonians. So as the prophet writes, he sees signs of hope. He sees signs of return to the land. He sees that whatever's happened to his people, God is the one who is all-powerful. God is the one who reigns over them, who reigns over the nations of the world, God, the God of Israel, has not abandoned his people. His people might not understand what he's doing, but God is still there. And the prophet speaks about God's provision for his people. 
water for the thirsty, milk and wine. The best possible food is what God will provide for his people. And all of that for free. There used to be a poster which said, there's no such thing as a free lunch, implying that we all have to do something or pay something in order to eat. Well, we once got a free lunch. We were in Grassington in Yorkshire, nice little town. We would go there sometimes when we had a day off and we lived in Yorkshire. And we were wandering up and down the street and we came to a place called the Church Institute and we were just standing by the gate chatting about where we might go for lunch because it was lunchtime. And while we were there, a very well-heeled lady came out and said, excuse me, would you like some lunch? Well, that's very nice of you. What's the occasion? And she said, well, the tr- what happened was this, she said. We are the Mother's Union. And we were asked by the Diocese um, of Leeds to provide lunch for some members of the Mother's Union of South Africa who are visiting Yorkshire at the moment. Now, they didn't know how many members of the Mother's Union this might involve, so they had catered for a crowd. What actually happened was they got two. And so they had an awful lot of spare lunch. And so we enjoyed it very much, and we did get a free lunch. I think we gave them a donation, but basically it was free. No such thing as a free lunch. The prophet says, come, come, buy and eat, even if you have no money. Come buy wine and milk. Come to me, come to God, that your soul might live. The people he's writing about had been long exiled in Babylon. Now they have the opportunity to return to their own land. And they also have the opportunity to return to God. God is offering everything to his people if they'll only come to him. And so the prophet writes, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. He's saying that God is here waiting for his people to return to him. You know, Jesus says much the same thing in the book of Matthew. He says, seek and you shall find. Seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added on to you. Isaiah says, come to the waters. You know, we have a love-hate relationship with water, don't we? We have to have water to drink. Our bodies are made up of 60% water, apparently, give or take a bit. And so it's essential to our lives. We can't live without it. But too much water is a problem and often dangerous. A powerful force washing away communities, flooding land. When we came to live in Buckingham some ten years ago, we were going through the wettest drought ever. The early months of that year had been fairly dry and the government had announced a hosepipe ban. As soon as they did that, the rain came down in torrents. And when we went to look at our house, you couldn't get into the garden because there were two or three inches of water all over the lawn. So we had to wear wellies everywhere. In the Middle East, they have a different relationship with water. The rainfall in Israel is about the same as ours, about 30 inches in old money every year, but it all comes down at once, mostly in February. For the rest of the year, water has to be carefully conserved or drawn from deep underground wells. So when Isaiah wrote, come to the waters, all you who are thirsty, he's speaking to a people who knew about drought, who knew what it was to be thirsty. But underneath, he's saying, if you're thirsty for God, you can come to him, and you will receive from him. And it wasn't just for the ancient Israelites, but it's for us too. If we are thirsty for God, we can come to him, and he will refresh us. Jesus said, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from him. So it's not just for us to receive, but for us to give to those around us. What does God say to us? In our world, in our day, horrible things are happening. God didn't do those things to us, to them, to our world. We might well cry out to God, why don't you bring it to an end right now? But then so many of the bad things that happen in our world are the result of mankind's sin and sometimes of our own sin. Jesus is saying here, just give it time. God is patient with his world. And to Peter, Peter puts it like this. He says the present heavens and earth are being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. 
With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Our God, who is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love's love, wants to give everyone the opportunity to turn to him, everyone including us. He says, seek the Lord, call on his name, don't leave it till later, do it now. We don't know what will happen to our world in the future. We can't know all the answers, but God in his great wisdom does, and it's to him that we come, and in him that we trust. Amen. We're going to sing again. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice that is more than liberty. Lost a verse, don't worry. <laughs> and let's come to God in prayer for ourselves and for the world in which we live. Let us pray. Lord, our God, as we look at the world in which we live, we're only too aware of the darkness that covers it. We look at Ukraine and we see oppression. We see injustice. We see pain. We see a nation fighting bravely and we see the despair of those who have lost everything. We see the consequences of insanity, of madness, of lies. And in all that, we pray for the people of Ukraine and of Russia, for their countries and their leaders. We pray for those who are afraid that your everlasting arms would hold them in this time of great fear. We pray for all those who have the power over life and death, that they will choose for all people life and life in all its fullness. We pray for those who choose war, that they will remember that you direct your people to turn our, their, our swords into plowshares and seek for peace. We pray for leaders on the world stage, that they be inspired by the wisdom and courage of Christ. Above all, Lord, today we pray for peace for Ukraine 
Lord, have mercy on that nation. We look at our world. We see a planet where the climate is out of control because we have exploited all its resources. Forgive us for our part in that. Help us to do what we can to change things. Help those who have the power to make changes on a national and international scale to have the courage to do so. And come by your spirit and complete those things which we cannot change ourselves. Lord God, despite all the things that are happening in the world, we too have our own needs. We're still concerned about COVID and the impact it has on our lives and the lives of those whom we love. And yet we're also grateful for the skill of those who have made vaccinations possible and the improvements in treatment that have allowed us to move on with our lives. We ask that you would come today to those who are unwell, that you would comfort them and strengthen them. We ask that you would be close to those who are in pain, those who are awaiting hospital treatment, those who are frail, and those who are feeling their age. Encourage them and surround them with your love. We pray for those who, are, who mourn. We think especially of the family and friends of Dorcas um, Stroud and her family. We ask, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that, you would, that they might know your love surrounding them. Help us as your church to proclaim the gospel of Christ to the people of this world, that those who come to believe in your name might rejoice in your salvation. We look forward to that time when we will be with you forever, to a time when darkness will vanish in your light, a time when sorrow will end, a time when all rulers will bow before you, a time when we shall meet you face to face. And so we pray, come, Lord Jesus, pour out your Spirit on our world, pour out your Spirit on us, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing as we close. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess him King of glory now. At the name of Jesus.
at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. <laughs>